question. Distinguished guests and friends, um, I would like to sincerely thank Steve Andrews and, and Kai Ming Cheng um, for inviting me here to share this week with you. It's delightful to return to HKU where the intellectual climate is so invigorating. And China, UK and North America all seem to be somehow quite close by. Hong Kong is a unique place and it's quite brilliant. Uh, it also has one of the best designed higher education systems in the world. And in this small space, with skyscrapers pushing against the ceiling, six institutions figure in the research rankings. And it's a great privilege, I must say, to speak in this lecture series and to find about the work of the Foundation has been very enlightening. Um, what good work it's doing uh, and what a great orientation it has to education. If education is the hope of China, which it may well be, then I suspect also, and this is a thing that underlies my presentation, China may be the hope of education. <coughs> this way. It's a very good time to talk about higher education. The sector is undergoing an extraordinary transformation at world level. Here I'm not referring to MOOCs, although that's an important development. I'm not talking about the growth of private education or student tuition in some countries. They're not really uniform patterns, although we in the English-speaking world tend to tell ourselves that they are. Nor am I talking about the widespread adoption of business models and accountability systems of which much has already been said. I'm talking about the larger social changes in learning, credentialing, and research. In the last generation, global participation in tertiary education has multiplied by almost three times. The economic and political role of science has grown markedly. There are indigenous research systems and world-class universities now in many countries. Global development in higher education no longer automatically means Americanization though US universities are still the strongest in the world. The map of knowledge power is becoming more plural. New knowledge empires are emerging in Latin America, the Middle East, Eastern Europe, and in Asia. Changes are most remarkable in this region. Here the great transformation of higher education and research is part of and contributes to the global rise of nations shaped in the traditions of the Warring States period, the Qin, the Han, and the Tang. Nations that have also responded so effectively to the challenges of contemporary modernization. When I say East Asia, I mean the post-Confucian systems, which are hybrids of tradition and modernization. The higher education systems located in nations and cities shaped by Chinese civilization, including, if we go back far enough, Korea, and through Korea, Japan. For the most part, that means Northeast Asia, but Singapore is in the post-Confucian group, so I'll use the shorthand East Asia today. Let's start with global tendencies to understand East Asia in context. There are two major tendencies to be discussed. The first is the growth of participation. The UNESCO Institute of Statistics tells us that in the 16 years between 1995 and 2011, the gross tertiary education ratio doubled from 15 to 30 percent. Participation in formal post-school education is climbing almost everywhere except in the poorest nations. Even in South Asia and in Sub-Saharan Africa, it doubled in this period, though it remains very low in Africa. Look at the uniform pattern of change in the OECD nations and other European countries. I mean, the GTER is well over 50% now in North America, Western Europe, Eastern Europe and Russia, and East Asia outside China. It seems that once middle income nations reach a tipping point, participation in upper secondary and tertiary education just takes off. There's no natural ceiling, no limit to educability, Demand and supply seem to rise together. 
and they just keep on growing towards 90% inclusion and beyond. And Korea, Taiwan and North America are there already. Consider what near universal participation means though. We haven't thought much about this. It means more than lifting the floor of possible productivity. For the first time, half of the world's nations are high participation societies. In those societies, advanced scientific, technical or social literacy and advanced labour market credentials with the mobility that they bring are common to the majority of people aged less than 35 years of age. We do not yet know what new potentials such societies might be incubating. Majority higher education spreads agency freedom and confidence across a much larger population. It widens the horizon of human possibility. It renders all states more transparent and more accountable. In East Asia, all systems except China and Vietnam have a GTER at or above 60%. Singapore and Hong Kong move from the old British pattern of binary inclusion and exclusion to the world model of universal participation, expanding sub-degree programs and pumping up the role of the fee-paying private sector, as in Japan and Korea. Korea and Taiwan have large vocational second sectors, but unlike the typical pattern in the English-speaking world, these are high-quality and high-esteem sectors. As the example of Germany shows, strong manufacturing countries are best placed to sustain high-caliber technical vocational education, in which vocational technical programs become seen as a positive alternative to academic programs rather than a second best option for those who couldn't get into a good academic university. Strong manufacturing countries can offer technical graduates a broad range of employment opportunities, so the risks entailed in investing in a tailored specific program are reduced. With the decision to transform 600 higher education institutions into technical vocational institutions and the creation of the technical Gaokao, which started less than three weeks ago, China has clearly chosen the German path. My colleague Po Yang at Beida says that in China, the national GTER has reached 30% in 2013. Though there is pronounced variation by region, as you know. In Beijing and Shanghai, in 2010, the level was 60%. The 15% in Tibet, 18% in Yunnan. The national target, I understand, is 40% by 2020. Now, what are the drivers of ever-increasing participation? Accelerated growth in tertiary education rests on economic growth and an expanded middle class, certainly. That brings the capacity to support tertiary education through both private and family investment and shared public taxation. In the next generation, the Asian middle class will multiply by five times or more, primarily in China and India, but also in Indonesia, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Philippines, Thailand, and other large nations, exceeding three billion people by 2030. That's not very far off, 16 years away. Incredible. But growth of the economy and the middle class are conditions of the expansion of tertiary education. They're not really explanations. Is it then states that drive participation? Well, governments act as if they determine the participation rate, but that is true only in the immediate sense. Governments have become followers of society rather than leaders in this regard. No government whether in a contestable polity or a single party state, can afford to ignore the aspirations of the middle class for educational opportunities for its children. The real question is, what drives these popular aspirations for education everywhere in the world at this rate? Is it economic pull? Is participation driven by growth in skilled labour in modernising economies, facilitated by governments that want more investment in human capital and are in lockstep with the needs of business and industry as expressed by its representative organisations and its leading corporations? That's the conventional narrative. I don't think so. Human capital theory provides a plausible metaphor and a policy rationale rather than a social scientific explanation for educational growth. The idea that the structure of educational output can or should be matched to the structure of work and occupations makes little sense 
in the real world. That is not how labour markets work. It is not how credentials are shaped. And it's not how credentials are used by graduates and employers. While economic demand fosters expansion of student places in fields short of labour at particular times, for example, mining engineers in a mining boom in a mining country, and while in some professions there is a tight fit between training and occupation, for example, the training of doctors in most countries, nonetheless, the overall relationship between higher education and the demand for labour appears to be incoherent. Consider, across the world, many graduates do not work in fields in which they were trained. And many positions that require specific training become filled by graduates from fields other than that of the designated occupation. I mean, it's the extent of half or more of the, lab of the professional labour force. Half. That is how labour markets work. I mean, at the point of job selection, employers take the most desired candidate. And specialist training is only one of the factors that are at play. In any case, much graduate labour, perhaps most graduate labour, is essentially generic. This includes not only most of the business studies, exception probably is accounting, the arts and humanities, humanistic social sciences, the physical and life sciences, but also, in some countries, the phenomenon of many graduates in, say, law or engineering working outside the professional field. For example, Korea, where a third of graduates are engineers, many of them go straight into business, or government. Russia, again, a very large graduate engineering population. Germany, Finland, also the same. And Australia in law, where more than half of the law graduates do not practice law. The trend to expansion of the relative weight of high school graduate jobs is also less clear cut than the trend to the expansion of graduate numbers. Phenomena such as credentialism, signalling behaviour, and graduates working in what were once seen as non graduate jobs seem to be at least as prominent as the expansion of high school work, high school work more so. The, the jury is out on the extent to which high school work is expanding. And it seems to vary by country. But participation in education seems to be growing everywhere at similar rates. Over time, the growth of participation is associated with the movement of graduate labour across all industries and down the status ladder so that graduate labour finds itself working in erstwhile non-graduate jobs. And graduate labour becomes the norm everywhere. That's what near universal participation means. The perennial debate about the education economy relationship, do we have over-education too many graduates, do we have skill shortages, is that the problem? That perennial debate, which of course are arguing quite opposite points of view, can never be settled. Both claims, both claims are based on false premises. The false premise that the economy and tertiary education normally fit each other neatly and any departure from a neat fit is somehow a social or economic pathology, but we've never had anything resembling a neat fit in any country at any stage in history, and we won't get one in the future. In the long run, neither generalisation, over-education or skill shortage can hold empirically. Surplus graduates migrate to erstwhile non-graduate jobs, and then over-education vanishes. Particular shortages of specialists can occur, given that most people are seeking generic credentials to maximise their flexibility and opportunity, but genuine supply gaps tend to become filled fairly quickly. However, while the evidence for economic drivers, human capital metaphor, is patchy and inconsistent, the evidence for social drivers is strong and very consistent. Families aspire to higher education both because it is seen to open up opportunities and provide better life prospects, and because it provides social distinction and personal enrichment in a range of ways. Arguably, self-formation through education has become a core aspect of modern life everywhere, like career planning or investing in the family home or fashioning a personal identity. Higher education is a condition of all these modern tropes in all of Anglo-American, West European and post-Confucian societies. The social aspiration for tertiary education is also driven by fear, fear of social exclusion. 
when participation expands, the average returns to graduates decline relative to the workforce as a whole. However, the position of those without tertiary education also declines relative to the average. Crucially, the rate of return to degrees, the graduate premium, is maintained. When participation approaches majority levels, demand for tertiary education is still powered by the desire for relative social advantage, but it switches from a matter of opportunity to a, an obligation. You have to participate. It's, a degree becomes a defensive necessity. Non-participation in post-school education becomes more than exclusion from the top part of the labour market. Effectively, it's exclusion from full citizenship. Dropout generates a growing cost. Take the case of China. Data for the 1980 to 2012 suggests that there's no linear correlation between tertiary participation and any economic indicator you'd like to name. For example, national production per head, which I've used here. Though the 1980s were a time of rapid economic growth after the opening up of the economy, participation in tertiary education was locked at 2 to 3 percent. 2 to 3 percent. That's less than a tenth of what it now is. Participation in secondary education also stayed down, and there was a sharp drop in secondary education participation in the first half of the 1980s, when the economy was taking off. Improved human capital was not essential for economic growth at that time, and nor did economic growth trigger early pressures for broader participation in tertiary education. Advanced skills have become more important now, as the economy moves to a higher value added in manufacturing than they were then. In the 1990s, the GTR in China trended upwards. And from 1999, there was an accelerated takeoff. Participation increased much faster than GDP per head, even though GDP was growing rapidly by world standards. The exact timing of this turning point was determined by the state, which needed to foster and fulfil the aspirations of, of the middle class, a crucial political support. The government decided to grow tertiary education and to invest in, in the infrastructure of both elite and mass higher education at once. At the same time, there was enough pent-up social demand from the growing middle classes after two decades of economic growth to fully utilise the new opportunities. And once the expansionary genie was released from the bottle, social, once social demand was freed up, the GTR just shot up ahead of target. And this growth has been sustained, despite the recurring cycle of temporary graduate surplus followed by adjusted expectations, behaviours and movement into work. Now the second major trend which I want to talk about is the spread of scientific capacity. All nations now want capability in science and technology, but not all can yet pay for it. Nations need an indigenous science infrastructure, just as they need clean water, stable government and a globally viable finance sector. In some, but not all nations, the drive for science is powered by knowledge-intensive manufacturing. For example, in Korea, China or Finland. In all nations, it's powered by the spread of technology across the economy, by the strategic importance of industrial innovation and by state building. Nations now need to be effective participants in the one world science system. And to do this, they must train their own research personnel. The alternative is a position of continuing scientific and technological and industrial dependence. The growth in research science has been almost as spectacular as the growth in participation. National science has yet to spread as widely as mass tertiary education, but national science has moved from being something that only highly developed countries in North America, Europe, UK and Japan could afford to being part of the normal business of established and emerging middle-income states. In 1997, there were 40 nations that published over 1,000 research papers in the recognised journals each year. By 2011, 14 years later, there were 51 such nations. There will be a lot more by 2020. The new science nations include Croatia, Serbia, Slovenia, Chile, Malaysia and Thailand, Iran and Tunisia. The output of published science grew faster in this period in Iran than in any other country, increasing at a remarkable 
per year between 1995 and 2011, mostly in the strategic physical sciences. But the standout region, of course, is East Asia. Japanese R&D emerged as a global player between the 1970s and 1990s and continues to underpin the manufacturing sector. Though university research funding in Japan is now marking time, stymied by the weight of national debt in fiscal policy, Japan is the highest public debt in the OECD and it really locks down its uh, potential state intervention. Um, in China, Korea, Singapore, Taiwan, however, things are still taking off. The research takeoff began a generation or more after Japan. Korea's investment in R&D in 2011 was 4.03% of GDP, second highest in the world after Israel. Well ahead of Finland, which is the leader in Europe, Japan was at 3.39%, China's investment is rising 0.1% a year, and reached 1.84% in 2011, which is above the UK. In 2011, the post-Confucian countries of East Asia, China, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, plus Singapore, invested $448 billion in R&D, a third of the global total, just below the $453 billion invested in the United States and Canada. Now, almost half of the investment was in China, where, which increased R&D funding by more than 18% a year in real terms, year by year, for the previous 10 years. Staggering. China allocated $208 billion in 2011, compared to $429 billion in purchasing power parity terms in the United States. Japan's investment was third after China. Korea was fifth in the world. East Asia has become the third great region for research and industrial innovation, alongside North America and West Europe and UK. East Asia channels a high proportion of its national R&D investment into business and industry, than does um, North America and Western Europe, but still a substantial amount which is the universities. Published science is increasing almost as quickly as R&D funding. Between 1995 and 2011, the number of journal articles by Chinese people rose by 16.5% a year and reached almost half the level of the United States. Published papers grew 13.6% a year in Korea, 9.6% in Singapore. 7.9% a year in Hong Kong. Remarkable rates of sustained increase. And of course, the argument is always made that this remarkable fluorescence of quantity is not matched on the quality side. Well, that's to a degree true, but the big picture is changing. Citation quality is now improving rapidly. At least in the physical sciences and engineering in China, which have been the disciplines that have, where government investment has been concentrated. Take chemistry, for example. United States um, National Science Foundation data, data show that in the year 2000, China published only 0.6% of the world's top papers in chemistry, rank, ranked in the top 1% by a citation rate. Now, 12 years later, only 12 years later, that 0.6% has become 16.3% of the leading papers. Absolutely phenomenal rate of change. Now, China publishes half as many top 1% papers as the United States. And its total number of published papers in chemistry exceeds that of the United States. Chemistry, of course, highly strategic in a whole range of areas. Strategic military, many industrial areas. There are similar patterns in engineering, physics and computing, where China now publishes more top 1% papers than does the United States. And to a lesser extent also in mathematics. The picture in biological sciences and medicine is much weaker in East Asia, especially in China that the number of Chinese life science papers published in nature has begun to climb sharply. So maybe the change is occurring. But when you look at the research allocations in China, they're so substantially tipped to the physical sciences and engineering that there won't be a huge change in priorities very soon. However, there's still a substantial gap between East Asia and the West, especially English-speaking countries, in relation to the number and performance of world-class universities. And Shanghai AIWU popularised the term world-class universities, so I'll look at its data first. The AIWU shows that the number of top 500 research universities from mainland China and Taiwan has grown quite quickly. However, global 
targets and measure progress are usually set in terms of the top 200 or 100, not the top 500. And here, the English-speaking countries are still dominant. I mean, there's just five Chinese universities in the AAW top 200, all in the second 100. And National University of Singapore, National Taiwan University and Seoul National are also confined to the second 100. Regional stars like HKUST and Positec are too small to figure in the AAWU, but the size factor helps the large Japanese universities in the Imperial Group. Perhaps the main problem facing Asian universities in the Jiatong, though, is the paucity of Nobel, Prize, Nobel Prizes. Nobel Prizes are open to politicking. They increase unnecessary noise in, into the comparison, in my view. So does the arbitrary weightings in the multi-indicator league tables. Multi-indicator weighting problems also introduce unnecessary noise in the comparison. The most re reliable data set is the ranking by Leiden University in the Netherlands, which offers a number of different single indicator rankings. Leiden research ranking is the most accurate measure of the global position of science universities in East Asia, and I'll now identify the leading universities listed for each system using that data set. Singapore's two main research universities have levels of performance akin to a top Swiss or British institution. NUS is in the world top 30 on the volume of science. The last column shows that it produces almost two-thirds as many high-citation papers as Cambridge, which I've included for comparison purposes, and it's 30th in the world on that measure, 30th. That is a useful measure of the firepower of a research university. It captures the quantity of quality. This is the number of top 10% papers by citation rate. I'll refer to this indicator frequently. On pure quality measures, though, which is, the, for example, a proportion of papers that are in the top 10% of their field, Asian universities do considerably worse. The United States functions as a very large national research system that tends to cite itself, and it dominates citation quality averages. NUS is only 112th in the world in the proportion of papers in the top 10% in their field. Even so, NUS is the second research university in Asia on this measure. Number one, Nanyang, the other Singapore university. Bravo Singapore, the most global higher education system in the world. China has two broad types of research university, large institutions with widespread across the fields of research and high paper volumes, but weak, fairly weak average citation rates in world terms, such as Shanghai Jiaotong and smaller universities that specialise in high-quality S&T research and have better citation rates, like Nankai and the Academy University, the University of Science and Technology. Tsinghua and, to a lesser extent, Beida and Fudan combine large size with citation performance above the norm. Tsinghua's performance is particularly impressive. The largest university in volume terms, Zhejiang, is the world's large, ninth largest <coughs> producer of, very, of public science. Very large indeed. Now, this table lists the Chinese universities with more than 10% of their papers in the top 1% in the field. Given the language barrier, these institutions must be counted as pretty strong performance. In the next generation, some of them are likely to really take off. Could be some very good emerging partner universities in this, in this group. Hong Kong. Well, I've listed six Hong Kong universities. The Baptist University is rather weaker than the others, but its average citation rate compares well with most small Asian universities. The SAR's universities face less difficulty with English language publishing compared to mainlanders. And like the Singapore universities, they've got fine citation rates in the Asian context, especially HKUST and HKU. The City University is also in the world's top 200 on citation quality. Balanced development has allowed a number of institutions to flourish. Then none are in the world top 100 on size, and all are constrained by the low allocation to R&D in Hong Kong. Hong Kong's research funding as a share of GDP is about 40% the level of the mainland. Perhaps that is the only factor holding the Hong Kong institutions back from Singapore levels of performance. There's certainly enough talent here. National Taiwan University is large, 41st in the world on paper volume, and it's exceptionally strong in engineering, especially electronics, which is where, of course, links to the vibrant Taiwan computer industry. And it produces many high citation papers, but its overall citation 
road is disappointing, as is the case with the other Taiwan universities. In Korea, Seoul National is larger than NTU and NUS, 11th in the world on paper volume, though it's 520th on citation rates. Again, language barriers and also a certain inwardness in Korea, and all, which is not as serious as in Japan, but I think inhibits, to some extent, the nationalisation of academic disciplines in Korea. The pattern of Taiwan is replicated in Korea, low citation rates, except for the research specialists, Kaist and uh, Postik, or Pohang, and the, uh, the Women's University. Generally, the cutoff point for inclusions in these tables was 3,000 papers over the 2009-2012 period, although a higher level was used in China, so I could get everything into one slide. But I've varied this 3,000 cutoff a couple of times to include small height citation institutions such as Postik in Korea. Finally, let's not forget Japan, still the world's third research system. Six universities in the world's top 100 on paper volume, with Tokyo, a colossal fourth in the world, on this measure. But Tokyo is only 342nd on the prevalence of papers in the top 10% by citation rate. Despite low average citation rates, in part, again, because um, Japanese en enjoys more prestige in the, in the Japanese university system, as an academic language than English. The sheer size of several of the Imperial Group universities ensures they have a high volume of top 10% papers. And Tokyo and Kyoto are fantastic in the physical sciences. On, this me on the measure of top 10% papers, Tokyo produces almost as many top tier world science papers as NUS, although it's much larger in size. Now this last table, provides the margins and leaf table for Asia. Kind of summary ranking of Asian universities based on the number of high citation produced, or papers produced, papers in the top 10% of their field. You might call this a measure of the quantity of quality, quantity of quality paper. Half of the top 30 universities are from mainland China, four are from Hong Kong. This single indicator provides a more accurate summary of the comparative research strength of universities in the region than the ARWU list does. According to this measure, there are 28 Asian universities in the world top 200, compared to 19 in the Shanghai ranking. Now, this, that is still only 14% of the world's top 200, but that proportion will increase sharply in future years. Nothing is more certain than that. There are lags between investment in capacity, publication, of science and citation recognition, and eventually the uh, showing up of those, all those effects in league totals. The output growth and improvement in citation quality of the last decade largely reflects late 1990s, early 2000s investments, quickened by recent incentives to publish in English. Recent and current investments, though, the effects of those are still in the pipeline. It's an awesome prospect, especially in China and Korea. There's still a long way to go. The top American universities are in a different league, and the US will continue to house the largest number of top 50 universities for the foreseeable future. But the goal of Cats Up to the West is now in sight. It's more realistic than it was. And it's clear that in future, a large proportion of global knowledge will be generated in East Asia. That's already the case. How have the East Asian systems achieve such progress in a short time. Though economic growth and the growing middle class are crucial, these are not sufficient conditions, as I said. From time to time, other nations have shared those conditions without launching an educational takeoff. We can identify two indigenous elements, I think. The capabilities of the distinctive East Asian state and the Confucian educational family. The development of higher education and science is powered by a fierce drive for modernisation, fostered by comprehensive states in the distinctive Sinic tradition, the tradition of the Qin and Han, which set targets, invest real resources, demand improved performance, demand international benchmarking, particularly with top American universities, and continuously monitor improvement. In this region, the quality of all the state machines is relatively high, except in Vietnam, where the takeoff, of course, has not occurred. Unlike the stage in the United States, the East Asian state attracts many of the highest quality graduates, 
it enjoys an unmatched social prestige, and it has considerable capacity to mobilize national effort for the achievement of common goals, though perhaps this capacity is now faltering in Japan. East Asia does not um, suffer from the endemic anti-statism, which is such a strong feature of the American polity, so that freedom becomes defined as being separate from and against the state and refusing to pay taxation, refusing to contribute to the Commonwealth. Consider the way in which China was able to secure support for a decisive move to create a second vocational technical se sector in higher education. Consider also the takeoff of science production in, in China, which, as the graph shows, moved ahead of the rate of economic growth after the late 1990s. The Korean state has likewise demonstrated a remarkable capacity to secure managed improvements, for example, in the school system. Although there are many differences between the individual East Asian countries, the comprehensive Sinic state operates in a similar manner in education policy, whether we're talking about contestable polities or single-party states. As the PISA results show, Confucian educational cultivation and shadow schooling in the home generate a consistent flow of high-quality students and junior faculty. The East Asian systems draw on a long tradition and a well of social commitment to learning that is deeper and wider than anywhere else in the world except perhaps in Finland. Though East Asian societies, unlike Nordic societies, are not particularly egalitarian in terms of Gini coefficients, East Asian higher education systems are highly stratified and the social elite dominates the leading institutions. Nevertheless, there is egalitarianism at the level of student achievement. There's strong piece of performance in the bottom group of students as well as in the top group. In East Asia, there is only a modest trade-off between educational excellence and social equity. This is very impressive because it's something that Anglo-American societies have been unable to achieve. And perhaps only the distinctive Nordic model has been able to achieve it in the same way that East Asia does. The rising East Asian research universities are a hybrid of American science together with indigenous educational cultures and Sinic state-powered modernisation. Will a distinctively East Asian kind of higher education, a hybrid but an East Asian one, emerge that is grounded perhaps more than at present in Confucian self-formation and the distinct this Sinic approach to academic freedom, with its emphasis on the social and scholarly responsibilities of professors. Perhaps, as East Asian nations become more confident at home and globally active abroad, their distinctive cultural roots are likely to become more important rather than less. I, but I cannot foresee what might develop. What is clear is that at the global level, Two most influential influences on the future of higher education will be the two zones where higher education is strongest. They will be the English-speaking countries, especially the United States, and China, Korea, and the other parts of East Asia. West European countries will also make their distinctive contributions. For example, the Nordic countries practice mass educational provision at a higher level of quality than anywhere else in the world. The Dutch system is highly inclusive in its social mix, as well as having a rich research culture in its leading institutions. And Germany, I think, is on the brink of a significant uplift in its research universities. However, I think my point about the key strategic importance of the relationship between the English-speaking environment and the East Asian environment remains. The Nordic model cannot be readily replicated elsewhere in the world because it depends on a high-tax, high-spend underlay. And there's, in any case, increasing convergence between the uh, English-speaking countries in Central and uh, Northwestern Europe, especially at the level of doctoral programs in research. Arguably, the central conversation is this one, between the changing, modernising, Sinic tradition, the post-Confucian world, and the changing, evolving English-speaking tradition. Now, this is emblematic of the larger encounter which will increasingly take place between the different Anglo and Sinic traditions in governance, state, and civil society. Now, Hong Kong knows about this junction because it lives within it. It is a pattern by both traditions. And here we see that both kinds of society are grappling with similar questions, but in different ways. How to liberalise the civic and political space to make room for popular agency in politics. 
the kind of strong agency which is already accessible in economic and cultural life, but not in political life. And how to do this without undermining the social order. China grapples with the problem of liberalising the party state from within, which may be the main road to democratisation in China. And the problem of creating and maintaining a stable, organic civil society that is able to accommodate dissent routinely and on an ongoing basis. Civil society and free contestation of ideas have had their moments in Chinese history, but have never been a permanent part of the polity. It's difficult to take them in. The US grapples with another set of problems, equally difficult. A political system in which money now controls politics, you need 200 million to run for governor and several billion to run for president. Ordinary participation has become meaningless and contestability as a legitimating device breaks down when the political parties do not offer substantial policy alternatives, as is the case in much of the English-speaking world outside the United States and parts of Western Europe. And in higher education, which was long part of the bedrock of American society and a great success for that society, in the higher education, the idea of the public good has been hollowed out and all the emphasis is on private benefit. And of course, the compact at the root of the great state flagship universities is being undone by this. How can the United States and the UK mobilise collective national effort to address emerging problems like energy and climate change? English-speaking polities are unable to deal with these kinds of problems. They're at the beck and call of their great corporations. They have elevated the legal right to trade above the public good. The East Asian state has a better toolbox to tackle energy policy, as illustrated by China's shift from coal and oil, and oil to gas, nuclear and renewables. In other words, both traditions have their distinctive strengths and weaknesses. If there is to be a stable form of global governance, and that is above all what we will need, it will probably develop as a hybrid of the Sinic and Anglo-American traditions. And if there is to be a more integrated and equal global knowledge system with greater respect for diversity than we currently have in a homogenising setting, probably it also will need to be an East-West hybrid. To achieve such a hybrid, all, par all parties, all the players will need to change. The East Asian societies have learned selectively from Western and especially English-speaking higher education. I believe that in future the West will not find that it has much to learn from East Asia. In higher education, too, both traditions have their strengths and weaknesses, and there are both similarities and differences between them. In both regions, higher education and graduates face endemic and unresolved problems of graduate unemployment, and all societies will continue to sustain the endemic, unresolved debate between liberal and generic higher education on one hand, and vocational and specific to higher education on the other. The answer, of course, to this standoff is we need both. Individuals need both. But surprisingly, few students pursue programs that contain generic and specific diplomas. In both world regions, elite universities are travelling well, although they're in constant danger of losing touch with their broader public good and social mission. And in both regions, providing mass education of adequate quality is becoming increasingly difficult to do. Amid the plethora of underfunded public institutions, small private ones, for-profits, marketing-created credentials, cross-border forays and online and mixed mode variants that are on offer. Some forms of participation have become so attenuated as to scarcely merit the title education at all. And that's happening in both traditions. There's little or no learning in those situations. The credentials will have neg negligible value. In both world regions, there's a widening gap between the elite and mass higher education within universal systems. This gap plays into the growing inequalities of income and wealth in most nations. The Occupy movement touched on that particular nerve, and it was widely felt. This is a key weakness of contemporary societies, and it may fragment them decisively, Higher education is complicit in the growing inequality. In many countries, the main indicator of inequality in education has shifted from participation per se, whether the student is enrolled or not, to the question of participation in what? What institutions? Which field of study? 
There are areas where we've seen non-participation has become a social disadvantage, a greater social disadvantage than it was. In short, both dimensions of equality, inclusion versus exclusion, and equal value versus stratification of value, both need to be brought into the policy equation. Now, there are also important differences between higher education East and West, and this is perhaps a resource for us. Perhaps this is where we need to learn from each other, if we can do so on the basis of equality of respect. These differences go to the nature of the individual in education, to the conduct of society and the state in education, and to global activity and relationships. And exploring these three areas will be the, my closing. First, at the core of higher education, in each tradition, is a distinct process of self-formation. As you know, the English-speaking countries, immersed as they are in the John Locke, Adam Smith idea of the, of the limited liberal state, emphasise negative freedom, freedom of the individual from coercion by the state. And they tend to play down the social situatedness of the individual. Thus, Anthony Giddens argues that the modern individual has no given identity, but must continually remake identity through reflexive activity. We came from nowhere. We have no context. I think this position is quite widely felt. People use higher education to change themselves and their conditions of life, and they seem to do so often in their own minds as unattached individuals. People use higher education because they want to become something new through enrolment and perhaps through study, even though they don't always know what this will be. This approach to higher education parallels other cultural notions of people as self-determining individuals, including the idea of the person that's fashioning their own career, the person as, as a decision-making consumer, the person as a mobile individual who can live in many places, fashion, body management, visual image, the emphasis on personal cultural identity, who am I? Social networking and its positioning of students as highly individualised celebrities for a day, constantly changing their images. Now, Confucian notions of self-formation, as you know, are different. They have a stronger moral and ethical dimension, and they place priority on key social relations. They have a much richer sense of context. This provides a balance of the high individualism of the Anglo-American countries. It provides, if you like, a more effective framework in which to exercise freedom if the two traditions are taken together. Though at one extreme, the Confucian tradition can be associated with the deadening of individual agency. The two approaches have different implications for values in the curriculum, for modes of pedagogy, and the public good role of the higher education sector. And we've not yet begun to explore the potential of putting those two traditions together. Second, the differences in the relationship between higher education and the state have profound implications. Perhaps Hong Kong will be the testing ground for the potential to blend together the two approaches. In East Asia, the state has a comprehensive responsibility for social order and prosperity, and it intervenes at will, not all of the time, but selectively in response to both short-term problems and long-term agendas. Thus, once higher education and science became government priorities, states acted decisively in a, in, a in a sustained manner, very impressively. The capacity for long-term vision is particularly valuable in contrast with state administration in the English-speaking world, which has become a prisoner of short-termism, like the political sphere has. The downside, of course, in East Asia is that the East Asian state cannot seem to stop itself from interfering in important matters like research, which are better carried out on an autonomous basis. It's difficult for East Asian states to devolve decisions to scientific community, on a consistent basis anyway. Difficult to let go, and this can stymie science. In the English-speaking world, the central concern is always the boundary tension between the state and the market, the state and civil society, between government and the university. So issues of autonomy are always central. While there's con con constant interference with autonomy and freedom, those two qualities probably start from a strong position in the English-speaking world. The downsides in the, of the state-university relationship in the, in the English-speaking world are that the political costs of an active policy are so great that governments tend to withdraw from policies designed to lift the long-term <coughs> capacity of the sector and government control is exercised indirectly, kind of surreptitiously. 
through rules, funding formulae, and the settings for competition. So the effects of policy are removed from democratic scrutiny. Third, and finally, East Asian and English-speaking universities pursue different kinds of global agendas. The Anglo-American institutions move more re readily into global positioning and activity in all areas. This is not so much deeply cultural as the outcome of their imperial domination of the last two, three hundred years. The American universities in particular have the resources and the confidence for active global forays without really changing their own identity. Coupled with the related fact, of course, that English is the one common language in global use. Thus, the English-speaking countries are far and away the leading attractors of international students. Mobility patterns are becoming more plural. In terms of inward student movement, China is now the third largest provider of international education after the US and the UK. Nevertheless, as my colleague at Beta, um, Jiang Kai, points out, only about a third of the inward movement into China takes the form of degree enrolments, and as yet, only about 7% of international students in China study at graduate level. Students who go to the English-speaking countries stay longer, and many seek to migrate. <coughs> now, these patterns will change, but it's not yet clear whether Chinese national language will become a global language of common use, which would be more decisive in changing the picture. Nevertheless, there are certainly signs of a more active global approach in East Asia. The Confucian Institutes, the founding of the Shanghai Jiatong campus offshore in Singapore, and the active foreign aid activities of China in, in Africa, Korea and Japan in Southeast Asia. The advent of the ARWU ranking was also important. The first distinctively Chinese structuring of global systems in higher education and science, and the comparison system is amongst the most powerful and formative of global systems in our sector. The higher education environment will change when China, Korea and Taiwan move from an international strategy to a more global strategy, contributing distinctive cultural contents to the world conversation and becoming just as engaged offshore with foreign partners as through onshore partnerships at home. Japan has found it difficult to move to a more global approach in education, despite its great achievements in research and its commitment to internationalisation. But Singapore has shown that it can be done very well. East Asia now has the demography, the dynamism, and increasingly the wealth and the scientific infrastructure to make seminal global contributions. Thank you kindly for sharing this lecture with me. I wish you all the best in your work, and especially in your international work.